Well, good morning. Welcome. Um, we have a quick presentation here. It's um, about 20 minutes, so we'll go through a, a set of slides. Uh, it's really around Oracle's ecosystem and uh, our container management and container products and container strategy. Uh, we'll focus on three major themes, you know, three developers walk into a bar, and uh, three different uh, sets of challenges that we see uh, container and container management, container application development going through, especially now and over the next few years. Um, uh, it's myself, um, I'm Bob Quillen, and John Reeve will be doing a, John will do a live demo, so about halfway through, I'll switch over to live demo, so uh, once we get through some of the slides and some of the overview, uh, we'll get some live hands-on stuff and give you a sense of what's really happening. And then we have a lot of details also at, the, um, at our booth. So we have a booth in, on the show floor, so feel free to stop by. We'll be there afterwards and for us today, et cetera. So uh, both John and I are from the Stack Engine acquisition, so we're based in Austin. So welcome to Austin. I hope you guys are having a, a great time while you're here. Um, and uh, you know, Stack Engine was acquired by Oracle about a year and a half ago, a container management platform. Um, and now we're part of uh, the broader Oracle Cloud group, focusing on container technologies. Uh, we've now uh, rolled out the Oracle Container Cloud Service, OCCS, came out end of last year. So we've taken the Stack Engine technology, which was a CAS, Container as a Service product, and now it's up and running in the cloud. So check that out. There's free cloud credits available, and available if for developers, um, some easy access to try stuff out, along with a lot of the other products we'll be talking about, so. As this is a, uh, you know, an Oracle-centric presentation. I got a little bit of a safe harbor, so you know, if I make any bad jokes or any promises, uh, you'll have to forgive me there. So, um, so you know, when we imagined this presentation, we wanted to hit sort of three major themes that really s help to uh, center what's going on in terms of Oracle and their container strategy. Um, they kind of center around three different types of developer challenges. Uh, the first set of challenges really came out uh, today at the um, at the keynote. I don't know if you guys saw the uh, Ben Golub and Mark Cavage presentation this morning around Oracle database and all the Oracle components that are going on to Docker Store. So first class uh, container images from Oracle's commercial products now on Docker Store. So it's, it's really pretty you know, outstanding that we have that available now. It's gonna be easy for developers. Um, these are first class capabilities um, and available for everyone to start downloading database, web logic. We'll go into a little more detail on that. Um, but that's one of the major themes is how we're helping that enterprise class of applications begin to move through that container journey um, that, that Ben talked about this morning and Mark mentioned too, so. When we started Stack Engine, the DevOps um, sort of user was kind of who we were looking for, uh, sort of some of the challenges they were looking at because developers had a lot of tools available to them. This is three or four years ago. But there were a lot of operational challenges to taking a container application from the laptop and moving it up to production. There's resource pooling, there's container management, cluster management, uh, there's orchestration, there's uh, health checking, um, going from a simple service to a very complex stack and how you do that. So that's a, um, a set of challenges that we, we took on as Stack Engine and now it's part of a, a broader set of tools. Uh, we've actually uh, announced an acquisition too this week uh, called Worker. Uh, I was mentioned at the keynote also, at the CI, CD2, really focused on container-based deployment for continuous integration and continuous deployment. So pretty cool stuff there around how we're furthering our commitment to the developer community. And on the cloud native side, we have a whole set of uh, uh, new capabilities. Um, if you had a chance to go to an Oracle Code event, there was one here in Austin a few weeks ago, and they're worldwide now. There's 30 of them going on across the, across the world. We have one going out of London this week, and then next week, I think, Prague and Berlin. So it's, it's all over the place. Lots of interesting content, broad in terms of how it applies to enterprise development, container development, microservices, AI, chatbots, all those kind of things. So, and there's, if you go to developer.oracle.com, lots of resources on, on the announcements today, and also um, the technologies that we're offering on a broad basis across, across the industry. So. When we jump on into this, I um, want to hit a little bit of the highlights around that um, and kind of recap uh, the announcement around the Docker store. So as Mark mentioned this morning and Ben also mentioned that we have a, a large set of our commercial images. Uh, they're now moved into the Docker store, first class citizens. It's Docker certified, Oracle supported. These are real database, web logic, Java, coherence. These are things people are using on a regular basis. And we actually use them inside 
our container service to to pull in and run applications ourselves. So this is actually very exciting for the broader con container community inside Oracle and then outside Oracle who are using these enterprise apps. Um, there's a, a set of apps that have already been there. If you've actually seen them already, MySQL and Oracle Linux, but Oracle Database is there, Oracle Coherence, uh, the JDK for Java, et cetera. So um, take a look at the Docker store, uh, go through the details, um, lots of uh, uh, really um, exciting capabilities for helping the developer community move these container images through that enterprise software development cycle. Um, so available through the Docker, Docker store. Um, in GitHub, we have a lot of the Docker files that help you run those, simple Docker run commands, et cetera, but a lot of the, the help commands are available through uh, GitHub, and there's best practices on developer.oracle.com. So take a look at all these resources. There's a really strong commitment. We're part of an application development group. Mark Cabbage, who spoke this morning, runs our group. So it's a strong focus around microservices, containers, container technologies that can run on-prem, but also up in the cloud, like some of our technology. So that's the first major challenge there um, for the enterprise or development capabilities and getting them through this container uh, journey uh, that was mentioned this morning. Um, if you know, uh, if you've been over to the, the Docker Hub already, we've, we have a set of tools and a set of capabilities that have been there. Uh, over the, um, the last few years around Oracle Linux, OpenJDK, NoSQL, et cetera. So more things that are available for you. Okay, so second theme I want to hit on too then is uh, what's available up on our cloud to support container development. Uh, I mentioned we made a major acquisition on a Monday around Worker CICD, and that kind of complements an already existing set of CICD tools to automate the dev process move images into production on something like our container management platform, OCCS, uh, that runs um, uh, Docker applications. It's Docker Compose compatible, um, simple to use. You can bring your own YAML. You can um, import your own Docker run commands. Very simple to use. We'll go through a demo of that, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, but it also allows you to then manage that through the management cloud, which looks at AP, APM, application performance monitoring, log management, et cetera. So a full set, a suite of capabilities that are integrated together from the CI, CD side to the operational side to the orchestration side. Uh, quick overview of OCCS. Once again, we'll get a demo of this in a little bit. Uh, but it uh, allows you to then set up resource pools, do some cluster management so you get resource pools around QA, around development, around different applications, staging, production, et cetera, and deploy workloads and stacks of these different resource pools. You add your private registry, so you bring in any uh, Docker registry or repository, connect that in. We could build applications either visually or you could bring your own YAML, your own Compose stacks. Um, you have simple services, really complex, more composite applications, which we call stacks. Uh, we provide a whole set of these, 20 or 30, with the product itself. Um, some are just open source um, uh, uh, Elk stacks, uh, Prometheus stacks, et cetera, and you can see a bunch of those at our booth, but also some are web logic stacks and coherence and things like that. So um, the orchestration allows you to deploy that set of rules, policies to deploy where they go, um, set up how those applications run, um, how you spread that evenly across different zones, et cetera, uh, focusing on different pools or different labels. And finally, health checks and operations management, which allows you to then check all these things running in real time. Are they up and running? Are they healthy? Do they need to be updated? Um, what are the, the metrics associated with the health of the system itself? Okay. So I'm gonna uh, introduce John here in a second, but a quick overview of the demo. We have our DevCS and our CICD tools, uh, Dev uh, Cloud Service, which helps you to develop and build images. Uh, we can actually put those images up on Docker Hub and you can then use them any way you want. Uh, we're gonna pull them down into our OCCS system, run that application, um, and then actually work that and expand it and go from there. So I'll introduce John. John's gonna do a quick demo. We'll switch that over. Um, I guess at this point, we're supposed to rub a plastic. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's you go. Thanks, Bob. Sure. So my name is John, John Reeve uh, from Oracle. We're gonna go through a quick demo today. So. I'm a developer. I've got a simple node-based app that I've put in a that I that I want to run in Docker, and I'm going to I'm leveraging right now um, the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. This is actually a complementary service that comes with a lot of our other cloud services, like the Container Cloud Service, 
and allows teams of developers basically to you know, store their code, check in their code, kick off builds, and then promote those and deploy those to various vehicles. And in this case, we're gonna deploy it to the container cloud service. So I've got a project, um, I've got a few builds in here already. Just gonna click on, click on the builds here and we've got my, my, no, my node app, um, done a few builds. And in a forthcoming version here, we can build uh, the, the Docker app and then actually build a Docker image. So I'm gonna kick off a build and, and you can see it's queued up there. Now we're actually gonna push that right into the Docker Hub. So I've got a repo on Docker Hub, which is my, my uh, um, node app that I wanna run now on the container cloud service. Um, so if we go into the container cloud service, and as Bob said, this is a fully featured containers as a service platform. This is, you can bring your Docker images, bring your um, uh, YAML, your compose files, load them in here and we'll run your containers for you. So you don't have the hassle of having to stand up your own Docker environment. In a few clicks, you can do it just right here. And if we look in what we call our services, these are essentially templates for how to run a container or a service. We've got an existing Docker node app and we can see that it's pointing to that Docker image we had there on the Docker Hub. And in one click, we're just gonna go deploy it. Click. Cool, so my node app's running. Let's go, let's go take a look at it. And, and by the way, this can be automated from our pipeline, not just from developer cloud servers, but from any CI CD system that you have. You can call a webhook, call our API, and tell us to automatically go deploy that container so that you can run tests on it. Um, but let's go, uh, check out our app real quick and check that it's running okay. Cool, so this is a simple kind of load testing app that spins up a bunch of different REST API calls. I can change the number of, kind of like concurrent API calls that are happening in threads and that's cool. And we've actually, uh, we, we use this and um, a lot, as a developer I wanna use this to, to do some load testing and test some load balancing, that kind of stuff. But I actually wanna save the results of that into a database. Right now it's just kind of operating in memory, I wanna be able to store the results of these transactions in a database. So as a developer, I can go on the Docker store now, as of the announcement you saw today, just put Oracle into your, your browser here and search for it. And sure enough, all the Oracle products are here. I want the Oracle database, click on that. Um, literally just uh, agree to the terms here, say get content, uh, check I agree to the terms, click. And you'll get taken through to uh, in the Docker store, a place where you can go set up and it gives you basically the Docker pull command here where I can pull that image down and, and run it. It's super easy. Um, but in this case, I wanna deploy the, um, I wanna deploy the database in the container cloud service. First thing I wanna do is I wanna wire up the container cloud service to be able to access the Docker store and be able to pull down any images, whether it's the Oracle database, any Oracle products or any other products from the Docker store. If we go in, it's, it's very simple. It looks a lot like just connecting to the regular Docker hub but I got this uh, slash forward store here. I put in my Docker credentials. I can validate my connection. Cool, I'm, I'm connected to the store. I can download those images. And now we just go and create a, a service, what we call again, a, a template for how to run this container of the Oracle database. Here you can see we're referencing that Docker pool location where that's, that image is. Um, any other runtime, I've got a bunch of environment variables here. In fact, if I want to, I can just copy and paste my Docker run command in here and it'll create this service for me automatically. And then I go run it. And I've got one running here, the Oracle DB. Here's my database live running in a Docker container on the container cloud service. I can go into this container. I can check out the logs. And I can see, cool, my database is up. It's ready to use. And I'm ready to hook my database up to my node app so I can start logging those transactions. So I'm gonna go in there. I've got my node app. I've got my database. I'm gonna create what we call a new stack. And a stack is simply a collection of services that are wired together. I'm gonna to drop in, I'm gonna drop my node app in there and I'm gonna drop my Oracle database in there and I'm gonna call it my, my, my final stack here and I'm gonna save that off. And cool, I've got a complete stack that I've created from my local node application wired up to my Oracle database running on the uh, container cloud. Cool. That's it. Back to Bob. Done. And no cowboy hat. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. That was cool. Um, we can give a more thorough demo or deeper demo um, at our booth, but come by, look for us. Um, we can go into some more detail and go through some of the other stacks that we have and how it works. Um, 
know, we're part of a broader offering. Um, you don't have to just use the container service. You also have, we have a broad IaaS offering at Oracle Cloud. It includes bare metal, elastic compute, our container service, um, and a variety of other capabilities. Ravello is a really interesting product. allows you to lift and shift uh, VMware workloads into the cloud. Um, uh, very little work there, too. Uh, so uh, it's a broad set of solutions that are available for Oracle Cloud. Um, so, you know, as a summary, at Oracle, from a container perspective, we have our, our base capabilities across the bare metal cloud and Oracle Compute. I ask, you do it yourself, you can bring your own containers, you can run on top of the container service that we just saw, and on top of that, any other types of services you want to bring, including many of the ones we announced today for the Docker store. I mentioned the code events are going on worldwide, focusing on containers, microservices, um, AI chatbots. It's a really, really good program. Um, it was here in Austin. We had a really great turnout. And um, so if, if you have a chance or hit your city, come by. It's actually well worth attending. If not, there's a lot of resources, videos, a bunch of content available on uh, developer.oracle.com slash code. Um, also, we encourage everyone to go out and try some stuff. Um, there's 300 free cloud credits available uh, for developers, so come on and uh, take advantage of that. You can go to developer.oracle.com or check us out at Oracle Devs on Twitter. Um, try it out and uh, you know, check out the things you're seeing today, and we look forward to actually working with you on that. So quick uh, summary, uh, Docker Store announcement today. Uh, big uh, push forward in terms of container availability for enterprise components, particularly Oracle components. Um, we want to deliver this best experience across what we do, um, be it in the cloud, be it on our IaaS, be it in your environment, on-prem, et cetera. And looking to develop uh, a broader uh, engagement with you guys in terms of developers, et cetera. So once again, come by, see us at our meetups, come see us at our Oracle Code events, come by our booth, and we look forward to uh, working with you guys. Thanks, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, morning, everyone. My name is Oscar Elias. I'm, uh, I'm from Accenture. Came all the way from Helsinki uh, to talk to you today about uh, some boring stuff. I know we all like microservices and microservices containers, you know, kind of match made in heaven. But um, I mean, typically when we work with our clients, it's like we start with microservices. You know, it's, it's really easy, you know, take your Spring Boot, take your Node.js application, put it in a container, drop it into TDC, and you're done in, in pretty much no time. And then clients, the, the, the message of containers is not lost with our clients. They see that this is really easy, it's fast, flexible, agile, you know, it gives a lot of uh, control over what we deploy, where and how. Scaling is trivial. And then they look at their portfolio and it's like, oh my God, I have a thousand applications in my portfolio. Can I put this in a container? And if so, you know, what does it take? What, how is it gonna work? What do I need to do to my applications to make them work in a container, right? And then get some of the benefits around, uh, you know, increased density in, in their in the servers or VMs, in terms of the uh, the time to market and so on. So, um, I'm going to walk you through a couple slides on you know why we normally do this, why our clients are doing this, and then at the end um, I have a few slides around um, we've been doing this on DDC for uh, uh, one of my, one of one of my clients in uh, in Finland, and I brought some of the learning experiences around you know taking some really old legacy stuff, crappy stuff, right? To be honest, and then putting that in a container. Right. There's a lot of surprises there. It, it works well, but it, it was not like you know something you can do just by uh, clapping your hands. Anyway, if you're not getting in touch with me later, that's that's my information. Um, let's let's get on with the show. Um, as I was saying, the message of containers, our clients see that right. It's it's really clear that uh, uh, you know speed, agility, scale, resiliency. That's that's really there for containers. They're seeing that DevOps is also very uh, a great enabler. Cloud, it's all in there, right? And and that's leading them to containers, right? Um, but why are they doing it? So we typically see this from two perspectives. One of them is the, the IT value in terms of, of the business case. Many times, these exercises will be IT driven, right? And they, we help them put together some sort of a business case. And, and it's quite, quite classic, right? So in terms of uh, infrastructure, reduce the number of licenses, for example. Reduce the, uh, you know, increase the density of containers. We can run more on the same hardware compared to VMs, the platforms are more, much more flexible. We'll talk later about um, using containers to get to cloud. It's one of the also major drivers from a business perspective. Then in terms of the, the DevOps, something we're doing a lot is um, once we have a thing in a container, an application, we can start automating a lot of the deployment and provisioning processes, right? Applications, you know, 10, 10 15 year old stuff that it only works, it only builds in my computer. It only can be deployed by that guy from his computer because he knows how to do it. 
once it's in a container, it's a lot easier to actually automate that stuff. And that's something we always do when we put things in, in legacy stuff in containers. And then ultimately, the, the architecture, that's also relevant for, for legacy stuff, brownfield migration, but still, especially when looking at microservices, obviously, as I said before, pretty good match with containers. Now, that's IT, and many times this is an IT driven exercise, but sometimes it will be also a business driven exercise. From the, from the side of the, uh, of the business side, um, speed to market, as I was saying before, uh, stuff that was always hard to deploy, hard to, to, to build and, and package. We now have a standardized approach for that. Right? Containers, same format, same, same means for uh, storing in a registry, same, same way to deploy everything. DevOps integration, CI and CD, that becomes a lot easier with containers than you know, with your 15 year old code base. The journey to cloud, um, it's, it's there in the middle because it's actually one of the biggest drivers also from some of our clients. Um, public cloud is, is a reality and our clients know that, right? Um, and they eventually, they may choose one cloud like Amazon, right? And they see Amazon is good, okay. But they also see you know, Azure coming out really strongly with really good offerings, becoming really, really you know, solid, solid uh, option. Uh, Google Cloud, especially price-wise, it's actually pretty competitive. But they may still choose Amazon. However, through containers, you know, we deploy today to Amazon. You know, let's keep an eye on the, on the marketplace in a year or two. You saw yesterday with Docker, right? We can take the same container on DDC from one cloud to another pretty much quite easily. Right. So, so containers are something that we're seeing a lot being used as the kind of the, the, the channel or the means to get to cloud, and then later even change it if, if you know, the, the market and the situation is, is right. And then ultimately, um, compliance. If you look at what we can do with containers, right? we can define how they package, we define how they're stored, we define how they ship, we define where they run, how they run. We've not been able to do that with VMs in the past. We, we have, but it wasn't really so kind of uh, de facto standardized on, on a format like containers and DDC can do, right? So, so that's also very important for some of our clients, especially in, in highly regulated industries like uh, financial services. This is pretty important. The fact that they can control end-to-end -end in a container. They can see what's inside. They can see if it's vulnerable. And if it's, not, if it's vulnerable, please don't run it, right? That was a lot harder in the past than, than it is now with containers. Okay. Um, so. We've been doing this at one of our clients um, in Finland, because it's, it's closer to me. Um, it's a transportation client, so their business is not really running servers, their business is not, is not running cloud, so um, we have been helping them migrate some of the legacy stuff, really legacy stuff, like old stuff, um, from WebLogic on, on IBM hardware, AIX, to uh, Amazon through containers. So the first step with it is uh, take their old WebLogic stuff, put, in, put it in a Tomcat, sorry, JBoss container, package it, and then deploy it to DDC. Um, in this case, as I said before, this was a purely IT driven exercise. So the IT, the IT group said, we have to do this, it's going to bring us cost savings because we're also going to Amazon at the same time. We're going to use containers to do that. And last but not least, they have selected Docker data center and containers as their next generation application platform. So they're going to use it for everything, right? And, and I'll show you more about that in a second. So what was the main driver for them, right? So there were three key factors in there. One of them is the, uh, the cost reduction, obviously. 30 to 55, 30 to 50% cost reduction combined across, you know, moving from uh, on-prem AIX hardware to Amazon and containers. That was, uh, that was huge for them, right? Cost reduction was a massive, massive enabler in this case. Flexibility, um, they can run anything they want in containers, right? They looked at things like PaaS, but PaaS, you know, it was, it's a very binary proposition. Either you, 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 you code for it and you develop for a PaaS or you don't, right? Containers is like, we can put anything we want in it, uh, so in, in that way, it was a lot more flexible in terms of providing them different options along the way. And, and of course, as I said before, uh, something we've done for these applications is like all this legacy stuff that again, is only building in someone's workstation. Uh, it can't be automatically deployed. We actually build pipelines for that. And, and you know, we, can go, we can now go from, uh, from git commit to container deployed in a matter of minutes, right? So it's, uh, it was also a great benefit for them. But we had to build a platform. We didn't have Docker. Uh, so we, we settled on uh, Docker Data Center, or Docker Enterprise Edition, and it, as it's called now. And just to give an idea of the different things that we have. So um, yes, DDC is great, but DDC does not address everything you could possibly need, right? The, the, the boxes in the middle, the orchestration, networking, server discovery, that's great. It's in, it's in Docker Data Center. You get it out of the box. But then we had to do a lot of work around you know, the DevOps stuff. How do I monitor my containers? How do I get metrics? How do I get alerts? So we've been working with companies like Sysdic, with open source stuff like, like Elk for getting the logs. And 
we built a full application platform with Docker Data Center at the core, right? But the message here is there was a bit more to it than just deploying DDC. There's some work you have to do to, to run containers at scale and be able to support you know, any kind of workload you can think of on that. Some numbers on, on the landscape. Um, so I'm focusing today on the legacy of workloads, but our client runs microservices, all their next, next gen stuff is on microservices. So again, one of the flexibilities of, of containers and, and DDC in, in general, we can mix and match. So, so one workload, one, one platform for any kind of workload, whether it's, it's brownfield stuff or greenfield stuff, microservices, we can write on the same container platform. It's just one big cluster. Well, in fact, it's two, one for non-production and one for production purposes. Um, some numbers there, 15,000 images in ETR, and it's growing like at a hundred, couple hundred per day, so it's, uh, our teams are pretty, pretty trigger happy when it comes to their pipelines and everything. Um, so far, we have about uh, 150 to 200 containers on a regular basis, so it's, uh, it's so much we'll be growing. And then we expect uh, in the near future about 50 nodes across product and prod, and then in, 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 a, in a few more months, we're probably gonna double that as we deploy more and more of the stuff on, on containers. And then um, it's a shared platform, right? So it's not just Accenture building things. We have like five, six different partners and, and we, did, we definitely leverage all the features in DDC around isolation and, and role-based access control so that we don't have teams stepping on each other's toes and teams you know, accessing each other's containers. So it's actually been, from a DDC perspective, it's been quite a successful implementation in, in my opinion. So this was about the uh, the platform, but how do we do it? So I mentioned our clients have these really huge application portfolios. So we go basically through three steps, right? First of all, we qualify. So we get the portfolio. We do it very in a very uh, top-down manner, right? So we have a few basic questions about the applications that we know, you know, should we do this one right away because it's simple or should we do it later? It depends. Uh, there's a bunch of questions I will tell you. We'll give, we'll give you an idea of how you should prioritize this application in terms of putting it in the container. Once we have that, um, you know, we, we consultants would like to have a number on everything and estimate everything as much as we can. So we have an estimate for containers. There's a, a really like 85, 90 questions that actually are quite specific about is it, you know, it asks like, uh, what's your operating system? What are you running? Are you running an application server? If it's an application server, do you have uh, JE clustering? Do you need to do sticky load balancing? Basic stuff that actually has an impact on how you're gonna craft those composed files and how you're gonna use uh, the, the HRM and so on. So it's there, we get a number, and then at the end we have the implementation process, which is pretty, pretty straightforward and standardized so that we do the migration and containerization you know, in the same way for every container. It's pretty, uh, pretty industrialized. All right, so a few of the, of the learning experiences, um, very practical stuff. Uh, we have a team that does this. Many clients have actually their own team that does containerization. Um, but it's not really an IT exercise only. Um, we have found along the way that we will need support from the application teams, right? And this is whether you do containers or you do lift and shift to cloud, doesn't matter. Um, you will need application teams to support you in terms of, uh, okay, this is not containerized. Let's get it to production, but it needs to go through QA, it needs to go through uh, UAT for testing, acceptance testing, performance testing. And that, that's beyond you know, containerization, right? So we will need teams to support application teams, application stakeholders, application owners. We'll need them to support the, this effort, right? So it's not just something that we write a Docker file, write a compose file, there you go. There's a bit more, to, a bit more work to it than that, right? So that's one of our, uh, actually one of, one of our most important learnings, and it's not really even about containers, it's more about, you know, the way we do this. Um, containerizing, I think I mentioned before, the, all the Docker files and all the Compose files so far has been uh, handcrafted. Um, we tried actually uh, kind of vacuuming a, a server and putting it in a Docker file as a, as a binary image, but that, that's it. that didn't work because it's not repeatable. It was really fast. I mean, in a 25 line of uh, bash script, you can generate a base image that is an exact one-to-one -one copy of the, uh, of the, of the application and server you want to containerize. But from a demo's perspective, there was no value in doing that, so we dropped it and, and it's been pretty, pretty uh, you know, manual work to create all these Docker files and, and then move all the application artifacts into the container. The application impact, um, there's a lot more to it about, there's a lot more to it than just these couple lines because we could be talking about this for a long time. But basically, uh, things like you know, application failover, Hot, hot call, we've been doing that on, on uh, traditional applications through a variety of means, heartbeats, load balancers, whatnot. In containers, it's actually, it's a little different. So even though 
we are not touching the core of the application when we containerize them, uh, some of the things will change. Like, how do we do high availability? Well, in many cases, we ended up with one container. And then, you know, UCP will take care of sp spawning another instance if the main one crashes, right? Uh, we didn't have to go through any complex availability processes or availability implementations. If the container crashes, the UCP will start it somewhere else. Same, same DNS name, we're good to go. Same thing with uh, scalability. In the past, um, especially with all this legacy stuff, uh, when, when our client wanted to handle more load, for some of these applications, they would need to install on the server somewhere else, install the application, then uh, call whoever is managing the load balancer, tell them, you know, we have a new, a new DNS name for our server, please add it to the load balancer. Uh, now it's like, well, you know, Docker Compose scale three, right? And then we have three instances. And then when we need fewer, then we do the opposite. So it's, it's actually changing, and, and it's changing for the better. So in a way, um, there's an impact to the application architecture when you containerize legacy stuff, but it's an impact that we think it's, it's for the better. It's, it's, it's good, good changes and positive changes all the way. Roadmap, um, there's two, two angles to the, to the roadmap. Docker is either evolving too fast or too slow. And, and for us, it was both, both situations because there are features we, features we wanted to have um, right away that we didn't have, and I'll get to that in a second. And then uh, there's a new release of DDC like every couple months. And we were like upgrading and upgrading and upgrading, right? So it was, it was quite, um, quite interesting. And actually, I'm getting to that in a second. Um, Networking, routing, and, and discovery. So what we found out is that overlays are good. Within the cluster, overlays are good for discovery, right? You get a deploy a container, put an overlay, it gets a name, and you can find by name. That, that's great. Outside, that was a little trickier. So layer seven, it's, it's perfect. Previously with interlock, now with the HTTP routing mesh, it's, it's not a problem. Um, we had some issues with layer four routing, right? For protocols that are not HTTP, like uh, JMS, RMI, we have a lot of the stuff we're containerizing is actually a Java, and, and it talks to over JMS and EGB to some stuff somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, in the brownfield work, it's not all funny and, and, and nice HTTP REST calls. There's going to be a lot of these legacy protocols. Um, so, with the uh, with the routing mesh, we can have global ports, right, and that's fine. But it's not always possible to have. You know, when you, especially when you have many teams that they need to uh, coordinate themselves, make sure you guys don't use the same global port everywhere. To, uh, we, we didn't really go there. We ended up having to do some, some scripting around Route 53, so when containers start, they actually make a call to the uh, Route 53 API and say, now I'm here. And then we were able to use through uh, public uh, host ports, so mapping the local port to the container port. We were able to do layer for routing stuff. We could use, for example, uh, you know, JMS, EGB calls to some services across known host names and known ports instead of having to use the, the routing mesh. Right? I, I simplified a bit, so there's a bit more to it than just, than just that. But just, just for information, we had some issues with this layer for routing across the, across the cluster. Persistence, uh, yeah, Docker, what persistence? Where's the persistence support in Docker Data Center? There are plugins and it's great, but uh, there's quite a few, so we had to go through a bunch of them. We ended up settling on uh, on Convoy, which is pretty simple, straightforward. We're using EFS, EFS in our case, so it's uh, exposed as NFS, and, and Convoy made it quite easy to work with it. But we would hope that eventually Docker comes out with their own support for persistence in containers. And I know in the in the greenfield work, it's not so important, right? Stateless containers, microservices, scale up and down, no problem. But you know, the second application we migrated with ActiveMQ and it had to be a clustered ActiveMQ. So we actually had to use a shared folder so that, or a persistent folder so that when the container crashes and it finds its volume again, when, wherever it starts, and it's, it's there. So we, had, we need persistence. But there was no persistence in Docker data center, so we actually had to uh, spend some time looking at the different plugins and ended up selling on, on Convoy. And then it worked great. So we've gone across Docker 1, 11, 12, and 13 upgrades. There's been no problem with the plugin interfaces. The Convoy has been working well. but. There's always a risk that Convoy will stop being updated. So there's, a pro there's a risk that uh, Docker will change the API, um, plugin API um, specs, right? So it's a bit risky, and, and again, uh, Docker, please, some persistence would be nice. Uh, Cluster upgrades, so that's the part where I said, maybe Docker's going too fast. We had a, a very painful upgrade of UCP. Uh, I have to say, Docker support was, uh, was, was great. They helped us through uh, 72 hours of, of downtime. It's the, it was a non-production cluster, so it wasn't. It was a big deal, but you know, it was not a production production size big deal. But um, 
we had issues with the with the upgrades and and maybe as a word of warning, you know, make sure you have all those UCP uh, key value backups. Make sure you have a DTR backup because we had to end it. We ended up rebuilding the whole cluster from scratch. There was no way we could get out of the upgrade mess. So kind of a, my warning to you. And then, um, as I said before, the DevOps integration, right? So it's it's a massive improvement. Uh, applications where they never even heard about automation, right? And now with containers, we can. Container, the application itself is a container, it's in DTR. We have a pipeline for it. We have a pipeline for it in, uh, in Jenkins. And it's great. The problem is, uh, especially when you look at legacy stuff, it's like tests, what tests? We don't have tests, right? It's all manual. And uh, in some cases, what we've been able to do is they go from check-in to deployment really fast, but it's, again, crap in, crap out. We never know. So it's a bit of a risk there. But that's, that's, uh, that's inevitable. Sometimes teams haven't been able to work on their tests, so well, we just go with pipelines that have no tests. But still, it's, uh, it's, it's been a really, really huge advantage for our client. Uh, yeah, that's what I was saying before. So legacy goals tend to be light on tests, which is a euphemism for they had no tests for their life. There was just nothing, right? So uh, it, made, it made the kind of the assertion of the correctness of the container a little harder because it couldn't be done automatically. Not from a functional perspective, not from a performance perspective, right? Is my container performing just as fast? Well, it seems like it does, but I, can't, I couldn't tell you, right? That was, it was a bit annoying, especially for um, when, we, when we looked into integrating, integrating this with our um, CI pipelines, but that's the way it was. Operations, and again, this, we, could go, we could talk about this for hours. You saw in a few slides ago, we, we talked about Sysdig, we talked about Elk. Um, operations change. When your container, when your application is containerized, operations will change, right? Uh, we, we spent some time looking into monitoring tools. We didn't want to run our containers with some agent inside just so that we could use monitoring. So we settled on, on Sysdig, which is a great tool. Uh, it will auto detect what's in my container. So if it's a JVM, it will start polling my JVM metrics. If it's Postgres, it will start pulling the uh, Postgres metrics. So it was good. But that meant dropping our client's old operational tooling and then moving to Sysdig. Same thing with Elk. This client didn't have any log aggregation tooling. We had nothing, which is fine. If you have a problem, then go log into the server, you know, do less and, and get the data you need. We brought in Elk, so it made a, it made a big difference. We're using the, uh, the, the logs go to the standard output, and then from there they go to Syslog, and Syslog they go to Elk, so it was great. But again, it meant a change to the operational procedures that the client had in place. Same thing with the run books, right? Uh, it's no longer just about logging into a server and, and restarting the, killing the process and starting it again. It's more about log to UCP, see what's going on, maybe restart the container, see that it still works, and so on. So again, uh, a lot that we could say about this, uh, but we don't have time to do that today. Uh, Operational processes will change when stuff is containerized, whether it's legacy microservices or not, it will, it will change, and we had to do some work around that. Uh, most of the work was done at the beginning, so when we built the platform, we made sure that these things would be taken care of, and, and now we're just leveraging, right? But still some work there to be done. That was it, thank you.